the ESF begins financing covert operations. It didn't take long for the Treasury to abuse the ESF. In 1940, the Treasury started calling the Stabilization Fund its secret weapon, and the ESF began advancing large sums of money to China, Argentina, and other countries. These loans had nothing to do with stabilization. China needed help holding Japan back, and the handiest place to get the money was the Stabilization Fund. The ESF became America's secret weapon against the Axis during World War II. Not everyone was happy with this development. Most congressmen naively thought that the ESF would defend the dollar, and they were upset. Not that this mattered. The Secretary of the Treasury is under no obligations to comply with the general laws of the United States in handling the Stabilization Fund. Because of this, the ESF has been a source of funds for discretionary executive branch spending, the likes of which Congress has sought to prevent, the Iran-Contra scheme being a recent example. The ESF has a long history of credit operations, and the tables accessible on the Treasury's website give a history of ESF credit arrangements. As you can see, the ESF has been funding covert operations around the world for nearly 80 years. Notice that the 1941 loan to China is not used. In fact, nearly all the ESF's credit arrangements are not used. That's because the 50 million loan to China was closed in the complicated terms of international finance, and the United States lent nothing as far as the stabilization fund is concerned. And the 50 million loan to Argentina isn't even in the list. So what type of covert operations was the stabilization financing? Well, the man managing the operations of the ESF during World War II was Harry Dexter White. White wasn't a normal Treasury employee. He was given large authority in vast and sensitive government areas. White was the official Treasury representative on all kinds of committees. This list shows White's widespread governmental activities outside of the Treasury while he was managing the ESF. Of special note is the OSS Advisory Committee. The famous Office of Strategic Services was the counter-espionage and counter-propaganda agency of the government. It was America's first intelligence agency, a vast and chaotic organization of more than 12,000 people. The OSS carried out espionage and put out black propaganda. Now, black propaganda is nasty stuff, and the OSS concocted some of the blackest propaganda you ever heard, all financed by the Treasury's Stabilization Fund. The ESF designs the world's monetary system. Virtually no one is aware that the IMF, the World Bank, and the World Monetary System are ESF creations. Beginning in 1942, the Treasury began playing around with the idea of setting up an international monetary stabilization fund. And by 1943, it had devised a world currency stabilization program. The Treasury's post-war money plan had two parts. The first part was a 10 billion United Nations Bank for Reconstruction and Development, in other words, the World Bank. The second part was an 8 billion International Stabilization Fund, which people now know as the IMF. The author of both proposals was Harry White, whose plan for the post-war international monetary system was endorsed by the 42 countries attending the 1944 Brenton Wood Conference. And, with the Brenton Woods Agreement signed, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund were created. Now, the Harry White who designed the final version of the IMF and World Bank was the same Harry White that was on the OSS Advisory Committee and managed the operations of the ESF. The point here is that White wasn't a banker, an economist, or a monetary expert. He was an ESF spook. His area of expertise was slush funds and financing covert operations. This was not the person you wanted to design the international monetary system. The Brenton Woods system, which made the dollar into the world's reserve currency, was shaped by the Exchange Stabilization Fund. You see, during World War II, White worked on plans for an inter-American bank, the aim of which was to frustrate Nazi penetration of Latin America. In other words, a slush fund, like the ESF, to finance covert operations. The plans for an inter-American bank did not materialize. However, they inspired the creation of the IMF and World Bank. White designed the IMF to operate along ESF lines. The ESF's own money was then transferred to the IMF, to which other countries made their own contributions. 
Finally, White took control of this giant pile of money by becoming the first head of the IMF. The ESF, through White, created a giant stabilization fund in its own image. The Brenton Wood IMF and World Bank were a camouflage method of lending billions of American dollars abroad. It was called foreign aid, although in some cases the countries involved didn't even know they were receiving any aid. Using these devices for draining savings out of the U.S., the ESF went wild financing CIA Cold War activities. And the one coordinating all these IMF and World Bank loans was the ESF. The ESF finances covert operations and then gets repaid from the IMF or the World Bank. Like the Gold Reserve Act, Brenton Woods was a guaranteed disaster, which was fiercely opposed by anyone with any banking experience. Bankers had fundamental objections to the Brenton Woods proposals, including their fears about what might happen to the dollar. American bankers were so critical of the Brenton Wood plan that the Treasury had to launch a propaganda campaign to get the agreement signed, and our international banking system was created without the input from real bankers. Donations welcome. For this particular video, I've actually purchased quite a few old papers and articles. This video has also taken months of my time to prepare, so any donations would be appreciated. Running the black budget, as is explained in Operation Rollback. The heart and soul of covert operations is the provision of unvouchered funds and the inviolability of such funds from outside inspection. In other words, untraceable, unaccountable cash. The ESF, with its extravagant freedom from scrutiny enshrined in law, was nothing short of ideal for funding secret operations. That's why, after World War II, when U.S. covert operations were transferred to the Office of Policy Coordination, the new head of the OPC, Frank Wisner, turned to the ESF for financing. Wisner's first plan of action to defeat the communists in the April 1948 Italian elections was funded by 10 million provided by the ESF. The millions were delivered to Italian politicians in suitcases filled with cash. So it was a slush fund established to stabilize the dollar that started the United States on the first covert operations of the Cold War. It is important to understand here that the ESF runs the U.S.'s black budget. The ESF takes in cash from a variety of sources and then funnels that money to covert operations. Here's an example. In 1941, the War Powers Act authorized the U.S. Treasury's Exchange Stabilization Fund to serve as a holding pool for captured Nazi valuables. This pool of money became a secret source of financing for U.S. clandestine operations in the early days of the CIA. And that's how the ESF runs the black budget. Sources of ESF cash include the gold confiscated from U.S. citizens, IMF and World Bank loans, money siphoned from the Marshall Plan, appropriations buried in the budgets of other agencies, and the income from illicit activities like drug trafficking. All U.S. intelligence agencies have been financed by this cash. The ESF is involved in everything the CIA does. More importantly, the ESF is capable of running its own covert operations. After all, the ESF has the unreviewable authority to engage in covert actions in international finance, and has been funding covert efforts since before the CIA's existence. Consider this. The CIA operates under some legal restrictions. There are no legal restrictions on the ESF. The CIA has been investigated by Congress multiple times. The ESF has never been investigated by Congress. It should be obvious that the nastiest stuff will be done by the ESF itself, and that America's darkest secrets are buried where Congress never looks and never asks questions.